everyone to another special episode of the buck stops here and of course i'm kirk buckner i run not in hall of fame.com the fictitious athlete hall of fame the fictitious rock and roll hall of fame and the united states athletics hall of fame and i love doing interviews with sort of like-minded individuals and thank you to uh our mutual friend Vinny los so i've got i get to call him just tubs <laughs> and you the, the owner of a blog that I just spent a lot of time in the last few days just really enjoying, uh, Tubbs Baseball Blog. Blogspot. Com. Oh, I hope I've got that right. Yep, Tubbs Baseball Blog. Blogspot. Com. That's correct. Right. Perfect. And just reading so much fun about older baseball and just getting a different look at some players that we haven't necessarily considered. Uh, you take a lot of what you do also in a Hall of Fame sort of uh, type of spin. And that's what I, I'm, I'm really sort of excited to talk to you about today. Uh, we're recording this in January of 2023. Oh, 2024. Sorry. Oh, my God. Hmm. Everything's just speeding so Time fast. Flies. Oh, my God. Yes. Uh, so we're probably uh, about two weeks away from the announcement of the Baseball Hall. But I'm going to be asking you about some people who are a little bit more retro and who are not on the ballot and some people who I, I can see that you're championing. And the first one, and I, I can't believe it because this is like the, the, the first, the, what is it? Uh, the second time in the last three shows I brought up his Hall of Fame candidacy and it's Dwight Evans. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dwight Evans is one of your big wants for the Baseball Hall of Fame. Didn't get a whole lot of support. I personally have him higher on my all-time list of of ball players than one of his outfielder teammates Jim Rice nothing against Jim Rice this is more of a, a promotion in my head of Evans why would that be right and why why do you want do you promote him um well I just think he had a I just think he had an excellent career I think when you factor in he had the eight gold gloves the almost 2500 hits almost 400 home runs um I think that he just had a career when you put everything together that it was definitely Cooperstown worthy, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody like Rice had a little more of a peak than Evans did, but Evans had where he put in the longevity. At certain points in his career, he was one of the top fielders. At certain points, he was one of the top hitters. And I also like his story of where he saw he was declining as a ball player, and he took action and worked with uh, Walt Pereniak. And that was one of my oh. blogs that I did was that he worked with him in 1980 during the All-Star break and evolved himself into one of the top sluggers of the 1980s. I'm not aware of that. Okay, I'll have to, I'll have to find that on your blog. Uh, when, mm -hmm. when did you write that? Oh, in 2018, I believe it was, I wrote that. Okay. That was the uh, the last of the, um, I wrote like, uh, I've written, written different blogs where I mentioned him, but I believe it was like uh, three articles that were focused solely on him. And that was the third of those three. Why do you think he fell off uh, the ballot so quickly? Um, I think part of it, he he had where when he was hitting the ballot, guys were um, putting up those crazy home run numbers because he hit the ballot in 97. Mm -hmm. And you had more guys that were getting up near the three and four hundreds that was making what he had done and what some of the guys from the 80s and 70s had done looks look paltry by comparison. Um, but of course, when Evans played, the ballparks weren't quite as he didn't play in some of the ballparks like Camden Yards and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And he played in more of a pitcher's era for a part of his career. And the 80s were kind of more of a pitch, not really pitchers or hitters era, per se. Um, and then he had where he, he had 1999, his third year on the ballot, he fell off. You had that ballot back then. A lot of voters only voted for one or two or three right. people. It wasn't like nowadays where it's 10. And you had Nolan Ryan hit the ballot. You mm -hmm. had, um, uh, what's his name? Uh Nolan Ryan, George Brett, Robin Yount, Dale Murphy, and Carlton Fisk all hit the ballot that year. It's a, it's a murderer's row, isn't it? And Murphy yes. never did get in. Uh, do you have Evans as a better player than Rice? I mean, I do, and I'm more than willing to sort of like admit maybe I'm wrong on that. I just like I just redid my all-time top Boston Red Sox, and I really screwed up because for whatever reason, Rice was on it, and then I never wrote it. So then I, it just got... And then somebody sort of like accurately so pointed out your list is invalid. <laughs> um, I probably have him slightly higher than Rice. Um, I think I would put Rice in the Hall of Fame 
and yeah. I'm glad he got in. It took him a long time to get in. Um, but I would say they're both good in different kind of ways. Um, they're pretty comparable overall career value. I know war has a huge difference between them where it's about a 20 war difference between them. Cause Evans is the, like round 67 or so. And rice is, I believe about 47. I don't have it a 20 war difference in my head. I have, I have it closer than that, mm -hmm. but I'm probably also factoring in rice's peak a little bit more. But I think right. Evans was overall, I think he had a little bit better of a career because he produced better. He produced for longer. He was a better player for longer, where Evans was a greater player for shorter. So that makes if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, no, it does. I mean, like war is a fascinating stat. And sometimes I look at it and, you know, in certain years, like, is it flawed? Is it not? Uh, there have been years where uh, current Blue Jay and was a Canadian. That's uh, obviously something on, on in my wheelhouse, although... This didn't happen when he was a Blue Jay. When somebody said to me, like, is Ke like war is flawed? Is Kevin Kiermeyer really like in the top 10 players right now this year? Eh, mm -hmm. You know? Oh, yeah, because he's got the fielding war. And fielding war is probably the least reliable mm -hmm. of of any part of war. Um, so it's hard to really know whether how much to value that. But we do know that Evans was a top fielder. He won eight gold gloves. Mm -hmm. um, I believe his fielding, the fielding part of his war, I think is about adds about six, six and a half war to him. If I'm not mistaken, because I'm going by the fielding runs part, which I think is about 66, um, where Rice gets hurt a little bit in that, obviously. And Rice played left field instead of right field. And Rice was viewed as a below average outfielder. But I believe war has him as a slightly above average outfielder. So yeah, I, I can't recall. He also played a lot of DH, which doesn't always help you. Correct. Yeah, which is where you'll have like, uh, well, just this last year where G Giancarlo Stanton is a negative. Mm, yeah. Is he a negative? I... <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I don't know. He's a, he's turned into a one-dimensional player, but that's, I guess, neither here nor there. Uh, another player that you're huge on, uh, myself also, is Bobby Gritch. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Bobby Gritch, he was somebody, he's actually got about, I think he's about 71, 71 war is what he has. And he's up there. Him and Lou Whitaker are definitely two second basemen that I think belong in. I, I was going to ask you about him too, because on your Twitter profile, which you can follow it up, it's a blogger Tubbs, I believe. Yep, blogger Tubbs, you got blogger it. Tubbs, yep, or X, as it's <laughs> called now. Uh, so you're a champion of Gritch, but when I think of Gritch and Whitaker, I, I have Whitaker higher than Gritch. Uh, I'm curious, uh, cause, but really at the same time, we're talking about two one and done players mm -hmm. yes. of the baseball hall of fame. Now it's not impossible for you to sort of overcome that, uh, Simmons comma Ted. Yes. Who do you see having the better shot in the future? Whitaker uh, or, uh, Gritch? I would say that, um, I would say Whitaker has the better shot at this point. Mm -hmm. um because he's been on, he's been on the ballot um he has the things that he has that grish doesn't have is he has over two thousand hits and that's that's kind of something that's going to really hurt grish always and he's never grish has really never gotten the momentum as much as whitaker has with when when trammel got in it's kind of like okay we've got we got this guy in well, how about his uh tandem partner and on the double play mm -hmm. and where whitaker and grish have very similar value I'm sorry, Whitaker and uh, Trammell have very similar value. And so does Gritch, too, as well. You have where with Gritch, it's a little harder because his career was split between the Orioles and the Angels, where Whitaker was a one franchise guy with the Tigers. But more than anything, that having over 2,000 hits, that helps. He's appeared on the ballot one time um, back when it was back when they were calling it the uh, gosh, they've had many different yeah, oh, they've yeah, had like three different time, incarnations. Yeah. Yeah. And but it was the one that Simmons got in on the one that Simmons yeah. got in on and Miller got in. Uh, Evans got 50 percent and Whitaker, I believe he got something like 38, 37.5 or 25 percent. Um, and then they didn't even appear on the next ballot because then when they had the leadership change from Jeff Idelson to Josh Rawich, I have no idea if this had any bearing on this, but they overhauled the process again. And they threw the 90s players in with the 80s and 70s, 80s players. And they put this, anybody that had their peak before 1980, they put in a pre-1980, which goes all the way back to like when baseball first 
was getting going in like the 1850s. So anybody in that that pre-1980 group, they're really hurt by that um, because that's such a large group of people. And Gritch is one of those players you would probably put in the pre-1980 group because more of his career took place. He had his uh, best year of his career in 1979, and he had some good years after that. But since he would fall into that pre-1980 group, I think that hurts him. Where Whitaker, hopefully him and Evans, now that they've uh, cleared off, they cleared off McGriff, they got him in. And I don't know what the Hall of Fame is going to do in the future as far as nominating somebody like uh, Barry Bonds or Kurt Schilling or some of those guys, Clemens that are a little bit more, mm-hmm. yeah. have a little bit more um stuff to their candidacy that's kept them from getting in so we'll see but i hope to see evans and whitaker both on the next ballot of the post 1980 players and they def they definitely belong in i know a lot of people would say well bonds should get in before them and i'm not here to argue that back and forth because bonds obviously we know with the uh different ped allegations and whatnot that's that's what hurt him we know why he struggled with it but it was nice to see somebody like Fred McGriff get in because he was actually the first person that I wrote about and the first person that inspired me to start writing um, about okay. baseball and everything. Wow. Okay, interesting. I didn't know that. I, I think with Bonds, uh, when we saw the last vote and neither Bonds nor Clemens could even get to that three mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we don't even know if they got a vote at all. Yeah. Uh, it sort of tells me that his peers or that group feels less strongly about him than the actual writers. True. True. Yeah. Uh, with Whitaker, I, I think I would agree with you also too, uh, or I guess we're both in agreement that he's got the better shot. I think it certainly helps too. He was power, part of that uh, power 1980. Was it 84? Yeah. 84 team. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was a bit for myself. Just I'm, I'm 51. Got him old. Uh, but I, I remember that season so well with that 35 and five start uh jack morris on this this the saturday night base or saturday day baseball game uh was it a no hitter i can't but i remember like watching that i can't remember whether it was a no hitter or not but i mean it was just an inc- one of the most incredible seasons i ever watched in baseball oh yeah i think he did pitch a no hitter early in the season i believe it was against the white Sox, but i could be wrong on that one yeah I, I, i'm wondering if that if that was the game i i, I might have watched uh you know with, when it was vin scully and joe garagiola <laughs> great I, commentators oh my god yeah like uh, vin scully remains my god oh yeah he's awesome yeah for sure uh now one person that you've got on your your uh, x handle i'm not very huge on and maybe i i'd like to learn why maybe i'm wrong here uh, you're a big proponent of uh, Tim Hudson being in the Baseball Hall of Fame. What am I missing? Yes. So oh, Tim Hudson, it's funny because on Gritch, Whitaker, different guys, I get a lot of support on. With Hudson, it's kind of like, okay, all aboard the Hudson Hall of Fame bus. And it's kind of like, okay, we got a lot of uh, vacancy here. Come on, let's uh, <laughs> let's get some people on this. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you a few notes that I wrote down about Hudson Please. and whatnot. So I've written a couple articles about him. Um one one was kind of comparing him to some of his uh some of his peers that got in the hall some of his peers that are some of the top pitchers and some of the recent pitchers that got in the hall of fame like uh like a uh, jack morris and whatnot so i did an article on that and also i pointed out in the article so tim hudson has a has a career record of two 222 wins 133 losses 625 winning percentage right of guys that there's only two guys, and actually Adam Dorowski, who you had on last time, he'll usually do a tweet about this, about Hudson. And so <laughs> thank you for watching that. That, that, only makes, players, that makes me really happy, actually. <laughs> yeah. The only players with 220 wins and an ERA plus of 120 or higher that aren't in the Hall of Fame are Clemens and a guy named Will White, which Will White was Deacon White's brother, mm-hmm. and he was a 19th century pitcher. So that kind of shows you how exclusive that group is. Now, obviously, Hudson, that's sort of he's barely in that group. Same with the Will White, Will White on that. But Hudson, only two pitchers that aren't Hall of Famers have more wins than him while maintaining the winning percentage of 625 or higher. And that's Clemens and Pettit. And both of them, Clemens, we know, would have gotten in probably unanimously had it not been for the PED stuff. 
and Pettit, he would have been really interesting. I don't know if he would have gotten in by the riders, but I think he would definitely have gotten in at least by the air committee at some point. And, um, and he's still, of course, Pettit's still on the ballot right now, but he would, instead of languishing around 10, 15%, he would definitely have like 40, 50, 60%. But being that, that Hudson's kind of the gatekeeper of that group. If you lower it down to guys that have 200 wins and a 600 win loss percentage or higher that aren't in the hall of fame, you get to where there's only 11 of those guys. And there's three of them are 19th century pitchers, Charlie Buffington, um, Bob Crothers, Jack Stivitz. One was a guy named Carl Mays that was a teammate of Babe Ruth that was famous for accidentally beaning um, Ray yeah. Chapman in the head. And sadly, Chapman passed away, as you know, from that. Mm -hmm. And then the other guys are Roger Clemens, David Wells, Andy Pettit, CeCe Sabathia, who will probably get in the Hall of Fame, um, Adam Wainwright, who just retired, and Lester, who just retired. And as we know, Lester and Wainwright, they retired with exactly 200 wins. They don't have the 625 win percentage. And somebody like David Wells, he barely has an over 600 win percentage. When I say barely, it's a great thing to have. But um, And Wells, his ERA is over four. So he's not somebody that's going to get in. But it does show you how exclusive that group is. Is Hudson's one of the better pitchers within that 11 guys that have those things that aren't in the Hall of Fame. On the ballot right now, uh, our mutual friend, Vinny Los Penuso, uh, he just did a pitch on David Wright. What's mm, your okay. take, yeah, what's your take on, because like Wright for me, and, and I, I told him I'm not big on him for the Hall of Fame. I'm big on him for the Mets Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Yet, I just don't see it. Uh, I don't know if he's even going to survive this year. I kind of hope he does so that people can talk about him a little bit more, but what do you think? Um, I, I kind of see his candidacy being a little bit like a Don Mattingly candidacy, um, which Don, where he's going he's gonna to probably stay on the ballot. He's probably going to get about 10 to 20%. I don't think he's going to get in by the writers. I don't have a strong opinion one way or another if he definitely belongs in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. His career was short. Peak-wise, he probably, if he, he could have put on about five more seasons and two of them be excellent. He probably would be a Hall of Famer, but maybe that that career length was just a little short. But I'm not I'm not a hard no on him by any means. I would say that he's just not somebody. If I had ten spots to fill out, I don't think he would make that ten right now. Mm -hmm. uh, another person on the ballot who I've never seen fall like this and historically speaking maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong on this uh omar Vizquel. oh omar well the thing about omar is he torpedoed his own candidacy with uh some of the stuff in his personal life unfortunately and even before that he was somebody you really had to you had to value two things with him he had to value his longevity and you had to view him as very high up on all-time shortstops as far as how good a fielder he was and the fielding part that definitely, he definitely was one of the best shortstops, but whether he wasn't quite Ozzy Smith level and the longevity was there, but that got him a lot of hits, a lot of games played, but didn't really add a lot of value to his case. But I've seen longevity help other candidates like, like a Harold Baines, for example, that helped him or a Jim Cott that helped those guys where they get close to a milestone. Um, but with Vizquel, he just, instead of having where it was an interesting discussion, it was like all these horrible things came out about him that are alleged. I mean, I'm not saying they're definitely things that happened or didn't happen because I mean, no, I, no, I don't, sure. I don't want to yeah. get into any legal issues on something like that, but and, it was enough out there. There were enough allegations that a lot of writers are just like, you know, you were kind of borderline anyway, and I'm going to uncheck that check mark. And that's mm -hmm. probably I wasn't sold on him definitely as a Hall of Famer, but I definitely just uh, his candidacy is kind of over there and ignored at this point from me. So, mm -hmm. no, I, I had him as more of a defensive compiler personally. Uh, somebody I would have loved as my, you know, shorts up for a long period of time. Having said that, as a Hall of Famer, eh, I was never there. Uh, I, I want to move on to the other component of what you do uh, baseball cards. Uh, what's your favorite baseball card that you have? 
Um, I think one of my definitely one of my favorites is uh, Jimmy Key's 1989 card. Okay. Uh, I love that card. That's a great card. Um, and actually one, one of the guys that I follow on Twitter recently showed where he had one that was signed. That was really cool. And the card is just perfect. I mean, it's just a, it's just a perfect, perfect card as far as the, the sky and the, the Jersey, the hat and the design and everything looks great. Um, Eckersley's card from that year is a great card. That's the one that's currently my, uh, my profile on Twitter. I, I, yeah, I know um, so that, those yeah. are some of my favorite cards. Yeah. Uh, is that, what's your most wanted card? Um, I don't know that I currently have a most wanted card. Um, honestly, probably I don't really have one that's out there. That's like a definite one to tell you the truth. No, no, all good. Uh, like, like for me, I had, we were talking about both this a little bit before we went on. And then I, like I, I used to collect and then I, let my mom throw them all out. Oh, <laughs> and I, I'm sure I'm not alone in that and that sort of thing. And then I recollected some of them, and you know, it's, at some point, I just want to like reget some of the ones I used to have. Makes uh, sense. Just for my own personal thing, not as an investment. Uh, so I was able to get a few years ago. Uh, my favorite player is a kid, Tony Gwynn. Nice. So I I got the the you know the laminate the, well, not laminated but I mean like the protected rookie card of that so. Like that one I have, I've got one of, uh, in hockey, Guy Lafleur, my favorite player, again, as a kid, awesome. which is beat up to all oh, crap, but not worth anything, <laughs> but it means something to me because <laughs> I have it. And I, I get, I guess I, I, I want to sort of want to finish up. So like with you sort of like also sort of like doing the hall of fame stuff and then sort of like the card stuff, uh, do you find that in your own that in your own life is it something that you just do for value or is it just something you do for your own personal enjoyment in terms of cards for the ones that you um, really want? personal enjoyment more than anything um i have a quick fun story i can tell you about tony tony yeah. gwen's rookie card um yeah. when i was a kid when i was a kid um i was actually at this this one this one place that they sold it was a hobby shop at the at the mall Mm -hmm. And so they had where they always had a binder full of cards. And so I see in the binder one day, and this is around like 1987, 1988. And I see in the binder one day where Tony Gwynn's 1983 rookie card has been put in a spot where it says 35 cents. And I'm like, I know that card's worth more than 35 cents. So I'm yeah. kind of hop hopping up and down in my head like, OK, this card, somebody's put it back in the wrong spot that works there. I'm going to buy this card. And I think back then it was valued at about not that, not that high, maybe about $10 or so. Right. But still to get something that's 30, 30 35 cents, that's valued at 10. You're pretty excited as a kid. And yeah, so the guy that worked there, he looked at the cards that I pointed to, pulled them out one by one. He didn't notice that that one was in a 35 cents. I wasn't the one that put it there. Somebody else probably that worked there, put it wrong. And that's how I got Tony Gwynn's rookie for 35 cents. <laughs> nice. I thought I, I landed a really great value card. Turns out it wasn't. Uh, a Wayne Gretzky pre-rookie. Mm. Uh, Indianapolis Racers. WHA. Yeah. Thought, oh, it's gonna be this has gotta be worth something. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's still something cool to have. Yeah, no, it's any Gretzky card you can get is a cool card. No, for sure. And so once again, where can everyone find you? Um, well, you can find me at tubsbaseballblog.blogspot.com or on Twitter X at blogger tubs is where you can find me. And my most recent article I wrote about the uh, 1989 and 1990 Ranger yeah, I saw pitching that. staffs that yeah. had they're the only pitching staffs that ever had five um, current or I'm sorry, existing at the time or future 200 game winners that were in a pitching staff. Only time in history. Which is crazy because it's not exactly like you're thinking of that era Rangers as being particularly good. They were uh, 83 and 79 both seasons. So they were an okay team, but they were nothing special. You had Nolan Ryan, who was still kind of in his peak. You had uh, Charlie Huff, who was finally at, he was like 40, in his early 40s, finally starting to decline. Great player. Yeah. You had Kenny Rogers, who was a rookie. You had Kevin Brown, who was a rookie. They were just finding their footing. Um, Br Brown was a starter at the time. Rogers was a setup man on the team. And then you had Jamie Moyer, 
great player, had a long, long career, but he hadn't found yeah. his footing yet at that point either. I, I always forget that he ever played there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Easy to forget that. Oh my God. Absolutely. Well, this has been so much fun. Uh, we're going to have to do this again. Thank you so much uh, to all those watching uh, like subscribe, all the other happy crappy stuff. Uh, check <laughs> out all the other shows here in the Buckner verse. Wherever Sounds you are. good. Look forward to speaking to you in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. So wherever you take are, care. wherever you may be, make it a great day because it'll never come again. Be true. <laughs>